It was the year Oklahoma opened to rave reviews on Broadway. Navy Lieutenant John F. Kennedy saved his crew aboard PT-109. The government seized the railroad in an effort to avert a strike. It was the year housewives flattened ten cans in exchange for meat. And it was the year you were born. The year was 1943. In battle, the U.S. and its allies stopped taking it and began dishing it out. The needs of our boys overseas came first, so everyone on the home front was encouraged to use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. Listen as we embark on a whirlwind trip through the year 1943. At home, the impact of being at war was beginning to leave a bad taste in everyone's mouth, for many reasons, not the least of which were the canned food rations. The target, Mr. and Mrs. John Brown. Now, you see, Mr. For every can you buy, I got to get blue points. Uh, yes, I get that. Except for certain things. Stuff that's not rationed. But for the stuff that is, you got to use tickets. The stuff that was rationed included meats, fats, and cheese. Sneakers were impossible to find, and shoes with reclaimed rubber were ruining gym floors. Extra, extra paper, get your paper here. Extra yeah, it says paper. here on the paper folks are, are shouting for sugar. If you ask me, they ought to give it to us. No sense of the sugar rationing anyway. Yeah, a lot of foolishness. War-weary Americans were beginning to grumble a bit about doing their part for the war effort. Why, they say the warehouses are full of it. Have you heard that kind of talk? Don't be misled by it. A wise nation does not eat up its reserve stocks in wartime. It rations them to make them last as long as possible. Once again, President Roosevelt fanned the patriotic flame and rallied the nation. As long as our flag flies over this capital, Americans will honor the soldiers, sailors, and marines who fought our first battles of this war against overwhelming odds. The heroes living and dead of Wake and Bataan and Guadalcanal, of the Java Sea and Midway, and the North Atlantic convoys. Their unconquerable spirit will live forever. Echoing the sentiments of the President, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill reassured the nation of Britain's commitment. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, I am here to tell you that we will wage that war side by side with you in accordance with the best strategic employment of our forces while there is breath in our bodies and while blood flows. By 1943, the tide was beginning to turn for America and its allies, and we were finally beginning to see results. This is General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Force. The Italian government has surrendered its armed forces unconditionally. Besides letters from home and the USO, radio played a big part in bringing a little comfort to the boys overseas. Hello, Americans. This is Radio Tokyo. And it was over the radio that the enemy introduced their secret weapon, Tokyo Rose. We bring you now another record by your own Tommy Dorsey. He plays Stardust. Listen to this record and think of your home. Doesn't it make you want to go home and give up this fighting? Please go home. To bolster the morale of our homesick boys, actress Joan Bennett took her position at the mic. Well, I always say, income taxes outgo axes. <laughs> Cute phrase, isn't it? It certainly is. Oh, it's so easy, so very easy for us here at home to make glib speeches like that. But it's you men in Africa, you men in China, India, and the Solomons, and heaven only knows where... It's you men who have to see to it that outgo axes. But there's nothing we aren't ready to give up and sacrifice willingly in the way of comfort, money, and time to reduce the sweat, blood, and tears that must be spent before you have accomplished our goal. Absolute victory. God bless you. Radio was king. It beamed the news from around the world instantaneously into our living rooms. It also comforted and entertained us. Played out on the full-color screen in the theater of the mind. On radio, no ball game was ever more exciting. Outside, ball three. 
And again, he either was bluffing the bunt or else they had the delayed squeeze on. Four runs in, top of the seventh. Three balls, one strike, one out. Here's your pitch. There goes the runner from first. The pitch is blooped out of the right field for a base hit. On radio, no drama was ever more spine-tingling. Okay, Morgan, come out of that closet or we'll shoot through the door. Grab him. No, 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 no. Look, honest, guys, I won't squeal, I won't squeal. Tell Ivan, will you? Tell him to keep the door. I don't want any dough, honest. I don't want any dough. Stop squirming, Morgan. Look, I don't want to die, please. I don't want to die. On radio, no comedy was ever any funnier. Thousands of dollars for one pigeon, Mr. Wimple? Are you Uh, sure it was a passenger pigeon, McGee? Why, sure I'm sure it was a passenger pigeon. Hey, if there were that kind of dough, I could trap that thing and sell it for... Oh, my gosh. Where's my hammer? Where's my tools? I gotta make a trap. Where's my screwdriver? Oh, I know. I left it right here in the hall closet. No, don't open that door, McGee. (laughs) And even out of the smallest speaker, radio personalities seemed bigger than life. Just a minute. Hey. Say, you. Have you ever played this number before, bub? Played it? I made it. Well, I should have known Jack Benny. I can't understand it. I've I've never played so poorly. (laughs) Cheer up, Jack. Sure you have. Quiet. Good night, folks. It was 1943 when one of radio's most popular and longest-running programs left the air. Another casualty of the war. The tin can shortage forced Campbell's Soup to stop sponsoring Amos and Andy. The show was canceled after 4,000 performances and 15 years on radio. Jive was a new danceable form of jazz, and the hip Tomcats were wearing zoot suits. A long one-button jacket with padded shoulders, high-waisted trousers, a wide silk tie, and a broad-brimmed hat. The sassy kittens wore either a slim, straight, clinging dress caught at the waist by a belt, or a more bulky figure created by wool box coats and suits. Hollywood kept us entertained with Paul Lucas in Watch on the Rhine. Jennifer Jones won the Best Actress Award in The Song of Bernadette. And Casablanca won the Oscar for Best Picture. Many sports figures volunteered or were drafted. However, there were still enough left to allow the New York Yankees to be the St. Louis Cardinals in the World Series. And for the Chicago Bears to win their third football title in four years over the Washington Redskins. Horse racing's triple crown was won by Count Fleet. And the brown bomber, Joe Lewis, was still boxing's king. Well, I think I'm in good shape. Very good. In 1943, a pound of fresh apples cost 12 cents. Butter was 52 cents a pound, and a dozen eggs were 57 cents. A ticket to see Benny Goodman and his orchestra for a weekend date was $1.25 per ticket. A pair of new shoes for the occasion would set a man back $4.20. His female companion would pay $7.95 for a new dress. If the couple were making a weekend of it, a room at the Hotel Chesterfield in Times Square, with a private bath, of course, could run as high as $6 per night. And that post-show dinner of shrimp cocktail, filet mignon, and all the fixings, including coffee and dessert, was 95 cents. <laughs> New in the nursery were Geraldo Rivera, Martin Mull, and sports legends Arthur Ashe and Joe Namath. I found myself bored on the football field. I'd never been bored on the football field in my life. As soon as I felt that boredom, Boom, it hit me, man. I knew I did not belong out there. Lech Wałęsa, Catherine Deneuve, and Jean-Claude Killy were new on the scene in 1943. Most important of all, you were born. Yes, in 1943, along with the Jefferson Memorial, converted rice, and the $40 hearing aid, you came into the world. Happy birthday. 